Were ancient legends about Stonehenge correct after all? Find out next on The Edge. Greetings, my fellow connoisseurs of all things strange, unconventional, and edgy. I'm Jay Jordan Hawk, and you're watching On the Edge. Well, it looks like Stonehenge is in the news this week, and that always gets my attention. It's probably the first Stone Age monolith that gets most people's attention as youngsters, because it's big, and round, and heavy, and that's pretty cool when you're a child. Add a few legends about Merlin, and presto, you're hooked for life. One such legend tells us that Merlin himself built Stonehenge, Preposterous, of course, but easy to believe when you're a child and easy to dismiss when you grow up. What makes this particular 5,000-year-old behemoth newsworthy this week is that it turns out, according to recent studies, ancient folklore might actually have been correct in terms of how this thing was built. Now, there are a lot of explanations for its construction, as when something this impressive goes back to time immemorial, there's a lot of time for people to speculate. Some of the oldest theories, however, might be the most correct, and for that, we have to go back to the early 12th century to the writings of Geoffrey of Monmouth, everyone's favorite medieval historian. And if you don't have a favorite medieval historian, then by God, you really should get one. May I humbly suggest Geoffrey of Monmouth, because this guy may have nailed how Stonehenge was built. Geoffrey is the one who tells us that it was Merlin himself who was responsible for the great undertaking. According to the legend that Geoffrey draws from, Merlin went to Wales, claimed by the Irish at the time, and used special wizardry to remove the magic stone circle and relocate and reconstruct it in its current location on the Salisbury Plain in southern England. Well, that, of course, has always been dismissed as mere folklore for several reasons. One, it's hard enough to imagine how mere Neolithic people could have built this thing at all, let alone built it somewhere else first and then moved it all the way to southern England. I mean, there are 50-ton slabs in this thing. And two, Merlin doesn't actually exist. My apologies if you're a fan of the musical Camelot. So, what has made archaeologists re-examine those assumptions? Professor Mike Parker Pearson, awesome name by the way, was digging around in the Priscelli Hills in Pembrokeshire and discovered that stones used to build Stonehenge some 150 miles away in the Salisbury Plain in England were first used on monuments in Wales. Pearson and his crew found holes dug into outcrops where the stones are from, but they dated to much earlier than Stonehenge. The holes were dated to 3400 BC. By comparison, the blue stones weren't installed at Stonehenge until around 2900 BC, centuries later. So, either they removed the stones and sat on them for half a millennium, or they built them in Wales first, only later dismantling and relocating them. Pearson said in an interview for The Guardian, we think it's more likely that they were building their own monument, that somewhere near the quarries there is the first Stonehenge, and that what we're seeing at Stonehenge is a second-hand monument. Well, that certainly got my interest, and whenever I'm interested in an age-old monument, it's always fun to see what National Geographic says about it, as they are rather fond of destroying people's childhoods. After examining some of the ancient folklore, including the Merlin story, they just couldn't help but look at more recent theories. They mock. Modern-day interpretations are no less colorful. Some argue that Stonehenge is a spacecraft landing area for aliens. Hmm, that's interesting. They are talking about Stonehenge, but heck, let's throw a jab at UFO believers. Never mind that the Pentagon has acknowledged their existence. Forget that. Let's just mock UFO believers some more. Of course, National Geographic doesn't cite anyone who actually believes it was a landing base for aliens, but don't let reality get in the way of a great straw man argument. So, National Geographic, that's one demerit for you for mocking UFO believers when you're supposed to be talking about Stonehenge. And oh, I'm not done with you, National Geographic. We still have more time, and there are still plenty of demerits left to hand out. More on that later. For now, enough poking fun at National Geographic. Let's get back to the story, or at least the part of the story everyone seems to be ignoring. Archaeologists are quite convinced they know when Neolithic monuments were first built. But now it turns out that the most well-known of these monuments is older than anyone thought. It was built somewhere else first, where it had existed for centuries before being relocated. How many other monuments out there have been relocated and are thus way older than archaeologists have thought? How many times has Stonehenge itself been relocated? 
Geoffrey of Monmouth himself tells us that even before Ireland, the stones were originally brought from Africa. Preposterous! Or is it? Get to work on that, Professor Parker Pearson. Another thing missed by all the stories reporting this latest discovery is that Geoffrey of Monmouth was writing down the Merlin-Stonehenge connection in the 12th century AD, but the actual act of moving these stones would have been done thousands of years prior. Just how long can a legend survive in oral tradition? In his highly unconventional work, Hamlet's Mill, Giorgio de Santillana, history of science professor at MIT, along with Herther von der Schend, suggested that much folklore is in fact encoded knowledge, handed down since time immemorial, going back to prehistory. Knowledge of astronomical phenomena like the precession of the equinoxes is one such example. Their work was so groundbreaking that it was suitably mocked by academics. Edmund Leach in the New York Times review of books called it pure fantasy. Of course, it's also pure fantasy to suggest that Stonehenge was relocated, but alas, not anymore. Pearson's findings suggest that ancient legends can survive thousands of years in a pre-literate culture, and that's an edgy story in and of itself. So, how about as academics, we do less mocking of unconventional ideas and hold a little more appreciation for the power of myth. Unfortunately, we have to wrap this story up, and I still have one demerit left to give out. So, let's also point out that in National Geographic's reporting of the Merlin legend, they say that the original stone circle that Merlin moved was built by giants. They write, According to folklore, Stonehenge was created by Merlin, the wizard of Arthurian legend, who magically transported the massive stones from Ireland, where giants had assembled them. Sorry, National Geographic, but Geoffrey of Monmouth never said anything about giants, though Robert Wace did when he translated Monmouth into French. See, that's what you get for being super educated and reading the French version. YouTubers like myself have to stick to the original English version and, as it turns out, the less fanciful version. So, that's your second to merit, National Geographic. Next time, check your primary sources. That's our story for today, everyone. I've got to watch my Blu-ray version of the musical Camelot, and now I can watch it with kid eyes, knowing full well that this story has preserved the childlike wonder of it all. Thank you very much to Professor Parker Pearson. As to you, National Geographic, you go sit in the corner and reflect on your demerits. I'm Jay Jordan Hawk. See you next time on The Edge. And if you like edgy content, check out my award-winning young adult novels, Puka is the Outcast, A Scout is Brave, and Unwatchigi the Dreamer.